This video is about appendicular skeleton. I'm going to use just the upper limb and identify different uh, bones and bone markings. Remember the appendicular skeleton, the upper limb is uh, held to the axial skeleton, that which is in the center, by the clavicle. Clavicle is also known as the collarbone. The lateral end of the clavicle articulates with the top of the shoulder. That is called the acromion process. This acromion process is part of the scapula, so this bone is the scapula. The acromion process, if you move medially along that scapula, this is the spine of the scapula. We have a vertebral border because it's close to the vertebra. This is the vertebral border of the scapula or the medial border. This is the lateral border or what we refer to as the axillary border or armpit border. Those two borders, the axillary and the vertebral, come together at the inferior angle. The lowest part of the uh, spine, or the lowest part of the scapula, excuse me. Inferior to the spine of the scapula, we have a fossa. Now remember, the fossas are referred to as depressions of bone. So this is the infra, inferior to the spine, infraspinous fossa. We also have where the pointers, okay, placed. I don't know if you can see that, but where that pointer is placed, this is referred to as the supraspinous fossa. So superior to the spine of the scapula, we have this depression called the supraspinous fossa. There's another fossa that receives this head of the humerus. This fossa is called the glenoid fossa. So head of the humerus fits in the glenoid fossa. And then the last fossa related to the um, <coughs> yeah, scapula is referred to as the subscapular fossa. So it's on the anterior surface of the scapula. Inferior to the lateral end of the clavicle, there's a process, process that sticks out. It's called the corocoid, corocoid process, or just a coracoid, C-O-R-A-C-O-I-D, coracoid process. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the humerus. I already mentioned this rounded part is the head of the humerus. It fits into the glenoid fossa of the scapula to form the shoulder joint. We have two uh, bumps, you might say, or projections of bone. The lateral one on the proximal end of this humerus is referred to as the greater tubercle. More medially located is the lesser tubercle. These are protuberances of bone. In between where my pointer is, this is the intertubercular sulcus. Now inter means between. In between the tubercles we have a sulcus. The sulcus is like a ditch. Um, so intertubercular sulcus, and we find that the biceps brachii tendon goes in that sulcus. On the lateral, anter well, anterolateral aspect, okay, we're going to have a bump of bone. It's referred to as the deltoid tuberosity. Of course, so named because of this muscle mass known as the deltoid that fits on the lateral aspect of our uh, shoulder. If we go to the distal end of this humerus or arm bone, otherwise known also as brachium, we have condyles. Condyles articulate with other condyles. This is the lateral condyle. It's called the capitulum. Capitulum. The medial condyle is called the trochlea. Trochlea. Now, in addition to condyles, we have what we refer to as epi. Epi means above. Here's an epicondyle. It stack, sticks out rather, you know, uh, prominently, you might say, on the medial aspect. It's just above the trochlea. It's called the medial epicondyle. Of course, we have a lateral epicondyle. It's not as obvious. In other words, it doesn't stick out as widely or as, or as prominently as what that medial one. The capitulum is going to articulate with the head of the humerus. I always think, put the cap on the head. In addition, on this radius, I say, so I say cap, capitulum is here. Radius, okay, is the radial tuberosity. This bump, okay, is going to be the insertion for the biceps brachii muscle. So, rather large uh, bump. At the distal end of the radius, we have a styloid process. And the styloid process sticks out. We also have styloid process, remember, up here in our skull, specifically in our temporal bone. We have another styloid process on the end, or distal end, of our uh, ulna. And I can't see it quite, but it's, it's there, okay? So think of a process like the stylus of a pen or the end of this pointer having a, a pointy end. So styloid process on the ulna's distal end, styloid process on the radius's distal end. 
If we go up the ulna, there is a process here called the coracoid process. Excuse me, coronoid process. C O R O N O I D. Coronoid. Coronoid. That process is going to fit into the coronoid fossa depression on the humerus when we bend, so to speak, our elbow. So coronoid process, okay, is on the ulna. Coronoid fossa is on the humerus. Now let's look at the uh, posterior aspect of uh, the elbow, okay, in arm form. So what we have, okay, is this where the screw is. You can see where that screw is. That's the olecranon or olecranon process. Now notice that's on the ulna. When we crack our funny bone, we're cracking that olecranon. The olecranon is going to fit into this depression of bone on the humerus when we straighten our elbow. So it's called the olecranon fossa. Let's go down then. I think those are pretty much the uh, things on the arm. Let's look at the hand. Um, and I'm going to look at the bones of the hand. I'm going to get it. I actually have a disarticulated hand. Okay. So if we look at the bones of the hand, notice, okay, the, this is the pinky side. You always know this is the pinky finger because if you put your fingers together, the pinky finger, of course, is longer than the uh, thumb. So if I'm looking at this from the perspective of what the names of these bones are, these collectively are referred to as the carpal bones or the wrist bones. There are eight carpal or wrist bones. The bones of the palm of the hand, so the bones that we can palpate pretty easily here, these are the metacarpals. The metacarpals are connected, okay, uh, distally, further away from the attachment of this limb to the trunk, to the phalanges. Okay, this is a phalanx, another phalanx, and the phalanx. We have three phalanges in every finger. We also have just two, of course, in the thumb. So that's the, uh, makes it different. So two through five fingers, two, three, four, and five. There are three phalanges. And number one, digit one is what we call it. This is the first finger. It has two phalanges. Digit two has three phalanges. Digit three has three phalanges and so forth. Well, we can't uh, do much more other than to talk about the carpals. Carpal or wrist bones, they all have names. And so we want to talk about those here, mention them, name them. I usually refer to, you know, a little ditty that you can might use as a way to remember them. Using the first letter in each of these words, there are proximal row and distal rows of carpal bones. There are four carpal bones in each proximal and distal row. Some lovers try positions. That would be reflective of scaphoid, then lunate, then triquetrum, then pisiform. So scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform. Some lovers try positions. Then we go back laterally again, articulating with this first metacarpal is going to be the trapezium. Then trapezoid articulates with the second metacarpal. The third metacarpal has capitate articulating with it, and then we have hamate with both the fourth and the fifth metacarpal. So that they cannot handle. So trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. Again, proximal row, distal row, four bones in each. Go always from lateral to medial to name them. Some lovers try positions that they cannot handle.